With your help, we can continue to fight for freedom. This is not possible without your generosity. Join our quest for the truth and our freedom. Simply visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash donate to make a difference today. Right, now it's time for an audience favorite, Cam's Buddies. This week we'll find out what they think about the government moving to ban gang patches. Can they do it? Will it work? And what about civil liberties and free expression? My producer has them all lined up and ready to go. Let's go now to Cam's Buddies. Hi, Lindley. Welcome to Cam's Buddies. Hello, Cam. How's things? Fantastic. Oh, that's good. Hey, we got lots of good feedback from your letter last week um, to Grant Robertson. Lots of uh, lots of messages. So uh, that was very well received. Yeah, well, it was a bit sad to have to say it, but I need to speak on behalf of all the people that have suffered the same fate. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, that was the message that we got from the listeners and it was uh, heartfelt and it certainly had my tears rolling down my face. So anyway, we've got a happier uh, note this week. We've got, um, I want to put to you a question about the government making moves this week to... Uh, ban gang patches. Do you think it'll work? Uh, what about um, civil liberties? Um, you know, issues with freedom of expression and those sorts of things. I'm keen to get your thoughts on these gang patches and these rat bags who wear them. Right. Well, the um, freedom of expression and all that guff. That's actually sort of under the Bill of Rights, isn't it? Mm. Mm. Um, and it did fail with Michael Laws ultimately, and I guess these gang people backed by heaps of money will go through the courts. I expect that to happen. I don't think it will work for a lot of reasons, but I do credit the coalition government for having a go. That's good. But in my opinion, this is all about money, Yeah. and there are many ways to make money, and crime's one of them. It's a magnificent racket. I mean, you don't have to have education, you don't have to abide by regulations or anything at all, not even rent, you know, nothing. You just get in there and throw your weight round and um, away you go. And gangs are crime organisations in a big way. And the incentive is millions of tax and regulation-free dollars, millions and millions and millions. Here's and they've the got thing. no education, but they are rat cunning. Yeah, they what are. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I agree with you, and it raises an interesting question that if they're not participating in civil society because they're criminals, because they're mm. visiting their drugs upon various different people and, and they're committing crimes against their neighbours and everybody else, Do they actually get to have civil liberties or do we have to wait till we catch them, convict them, stick them in jail and then take away their civil liberties? And so it seems that we're trying to say, well, we can't take away their gang patches because they've got a right to wear them for freedom of expression. But but the general population has a right to live without crime. Surely that trumps their, their little jackets with their little embroidered patches on them. That, that is correct, and of course the problem is it's not the gang itself, it's um, the crime that sort of spreads out from it and goes right through the community. Absolutely terrible. Um, you know, the methamphetamine racket is huge, mm. um, and it affects so many people, and they lure in these stupid young, you know, youth. Yeah and run them clean off the rails as well, although a lot of them, to be fair, are sort of going to go that way anyway. But one or two of them actually have reasonable sort of parents and tee up, you know, with other kids and they're in, you know, and their their lives are wasted. But it's, you know, as you say, with civil liberties, well, what about your home being safe and not worrying about it being burgled because somebody wants to pinch some things that uh, can go back to the gang and be cashed in for methamphetamine, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing. that's what's happening. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Maybe we need to, I mean, this is just a small thing, gang patches. There needs to be a more systemic approach to dealing with crime. Uh, You know, there's a breakdown in families. 
Um, there's the inability of uh, of Kiwi citizens to adequately defend themselves. You know, we get told, oh, that's all right, call 111. But let's say you live in the country, you know, uh, so out on a re remote rural area, some guy rocks up starting to steal your sheep or your four-wheel drive or your motorbike or whatever. You ring the police, they could be over an hour away. And uh, so you leave. Oh, you can't. You you can't even get them on the phone half the time. And, um, you know, I wanted to report something. There was a car left out on the beach early one morning, and I thought, well, I'll just pop through Amberley, and um, I, I wrote the number down of the car. Mm. It was very odd to have a car way out on the beach. Yeah. And I'll drop it into the police station. Well, when I got there, 9 o'clock, and nobody there at all. It's all shut up, locked, cobwebs on the door. Yeah. Police car outside, making us believe that there's police there, but there's not. Yeah. That must be the case right around New Zealand, but I've just got one really interesting figure here somewhere. Here we are, 33 gangs in New Zealand. Yeah. And they're now over 9,000 members. There's 10,500 police. Now, if they all united, uh, you know, if they had the brains to do that, if they all united, they could actually, and go to one venue, they could actually mow the police over now. The trouble is, is if brains were dynamite, they wouldn't have enough to blow their nose. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. But my word, they're cunning. They're cunning, all right, but they're not, they're not bright because they keep getting caught. And, and so... Uh, yes. The way I'm looking at it is the gang patches is just one thing. I, I think, you know, oh, I just we, think we need um, to stop this woke crim hugging. There, there, it's because you were breastfed, not bottle fed, or some other malarkey that they come up with. We actually need to s address crime at the lowest level and bubble that up so that we take an interest in ex absolutely every level of crime. I mean, you take all these... Ram raids, that was all gang related. You know, the gangs were organizing mm, that. You that's know, right. But they got away with it. People weren't allowed to intervene. If people intervened, the police said, oh, we could arrest you. You know, they got it sort of, you know, excuse my language, but the police have it asked backwards. They're victimizing mm. um, citizens who are trying to do the job they refuse to do. Yeah, well, the, that's easy meat, you know. I mean, actually going after the criminals and catching them uh, can be a bit scary these days uh, because, <clears throat> I mean, they've nearly all got knives and, uh, oh, well, they did away with guns, didn't they? But the guns are all in the wrong hands. And, well, you know, right. a friend of mine said, a friend of mine said, that's a joke. You can go down to the wharf uh, at Littleton in the middle of the night and depending what country the, the ship came from, you just go there and get your guns and away you go. Yeah, well, the, so, that's the thing. The government um, passed all these gun laws and all they did is take guns off law-abiding citizens. And then they've constructed they this entire massive white elephant of, a, of an organisation that makes people like me, who's a, a collector, um, they make our life a living misery. You know, if their presumption uh, when in, we have any interaction with them is that we're guilty. And yet there's oh, criminals yeah, well, out there with unregistered guns doing whatever they want, uh, and a gun register is not going to stop them um, having no, no gang members handed any guns in. No, and they've got heaps of guns, absolutely heaps of them. But I think um, just from a different perspective, because I know the guys will come up you know, with a lot of um, other stuff, um, I think until the authorities realise that this is actually the most fantastic business model in the world um, and get into cracking that, they're not actually going to make any progress because there's such huge money to be made. And as I said, they don't have to honour any regulations or taxes or anything at all. They've got free labour because they just recruit the... Um, uh, you know, the young young ones that they're bringing in, they get yep. them to do all the stealing. They don't have to pay anybody. And you compare that with trying to set up a, a decent business yourself. You know, there's no comparison whatsoever. Yeah, you've got health and, and safety, and my, you've got compliance costs, you've got, you know, employment oh, issues. It's it's a nightmare. Gangs don't have any of that, do they? They just, if they've got they a troublesome employee, and, and, they just shoot them in the back of the head. Oh, well, you know, it's just easy and life is cheap, you know. Um, but it goes on all over the world in different forms, from the mafia to the drug cabals and all the rest of it. 
they're all sort of the same. Um, they do do one or two useful things, um, I must say, for yeah. fraught people. They collect debts for them, don't they? They set <laughs> yeah. up insurance jobs and burn hay sheds down and intimidate yeah. witnesses for people. They do all they sorts do of do things. They do do that. It, it, it but, seems to um, me that we just need politicians. Sorry, we just need politicians with a will to actually not cave in to all the wombles that uh, think that it's all because they had a hard um, life, you know, um, being brought up uh, in a solo parent family or some other excuse that they always trot out. I mean, you know, we've got Golrez Garriman who says, "Oh, I'm, I was feeling stressed, so I, I felt the need to go <laughs> around stealing," you know. <laughs> Not half as stressed as somebody who actually can't afford to buy a cardigan. Well, that's right. A very expensive cardigan. Mm. No, she's a criminal. Um, and sometimes I think maybe Parliament um, in the dis- long distant future is headed for, um, instead of trying to build a new prison, they should just put a big security fence around Parliament and take the ones out that are honest um, they could sort of entertain them down at the local cafe and lock all the others in Parliament and you'd have a new prison because (laughs) um, I've never known so many criminals to be in Parliament. Yeah, that's right. So that's kind of another issue. But um, no, I think that with this thing, um, until they get into how you can stop these people from making such a fortune with no effort whatsoever. Um, they're not going to make any progress at all. You can take patches off or the, it's their jacket, isn't it, really? Yeah. Pull their jackets off them. I'll tell you what, I won't be putting my name forward to go up and take one off them. No. But I mean, maybe one way to reduce crime is to for the government to introduce the castle doctrine. Have you heard of that? No. There's some laws and no, there's some laws in, in Florida's got the castle doctrine and Texas has got it, I think. And that is that your home is your castle and you can defend it any way you see fit. And if somebody's inside your house, you can shoot them um, because you're yes. defending your castle. Well, I think that's a good idea. That's how it should be. And yeah. uh, you know, I can't even put an electric fence at the gate because I might sting somebody. Yeah, well put a put a bull fence in there and really sting them. <laughs> a bear pit would be good. <laughs> I'd probably run into it myself. Um, I always thought sharpened no, stakes and um, and and landmines was a good idea. <laughs> no, I don't know. They're pretty pretty cunning because the heads are, are of these gangs they, they don't go out and do the things, you know. No, they sit there and bank all the money. And, and you're right. The police need to to concentrate on the business model and taking the cash away. So it's interesting to see Stuart Nash yes. throwing uh, some of the uh, his Labour you know mates under the bus by saying, "Well, I wanted to make the the limit it, instead of you know, confiscations being for things that are over thirty thousand. I wanted to make it zero dollars. So we took everything. And um, and Kerry yes. Allen, who was the Justice Minister, said, "Oh, we're not doing oh. that because that would be racist." You yes, know. I know. Uh, she should know all about um, crime and everything. She's certainly an expert in the field. But Stuart Nash, you know, <clears throat> I actually was, I like you, I was surprised that he actually, um, well, almost snitched on his um, yeah. his other, um, you know, Labour Party people. And then I thought, well, you have got to, can't expect much else because he had a professional... Um, Snitcher, you know, in charge, uh, Jacinda Ardern, she encouraged everybody to dob somebody in, didn't she? Yeah. She was a snitch in chief. What a great title. Um, no, she she so, obviously never went to a school where, I mean, when I was at school, we had a saying, snitches get stitches. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody well, dobbed at my school. Be... There were no dobbers at my school. You got you dobbed, you got a hiding. Well, I'll tell you what, um, I've worked at the freezing works and if you dobbed anybody in there, well, you probably wouldn't live to see, see the next day. It'd be a terrible accident with a meat hook. It'd be a terrible accident, but of course it never happened, you know. No, it saw nothing. Because, uh, you know, it's that sort of strength through um, strength through power sort of thing or peace through strength, whatever you like it, to call peace, it. Peace it? through superior firepower. Yes, well, that would be good, but um, I'm not allowed a gun, so I can't do that one. No, oh, you can get one. I, you could go and get a licence. I'll help you get a licence. Oh, 
Oh, I've got a friend having to um, vouch for her daughter at the moment, and what a performance. Oh, I know, 36 I mean, honestly, pages of palaver. Oh, and I mean, why wouldn't you want to be a gang member? You know, they don't have to do any of this stuff at all. No, they, they, just, you know, ask, the money ask, be, they just ask the gang boss for a gun. Here you go, bro, take that. that that's that's right. Easy for them, but not for us. No, and, and, you know, as far as they're concerned, there's easy money to be made, and by hell, they're going to make it. So I can't see how the patches uh, will, you know, it makes us feel better, but we're not the gangs, are we? No. Well, I don't think it – I mean, I'm not afraid of gang members. I never have been. I used to tease them mercilessly with, when they'd turn up at the church with their patches oh. on and stuff like that, but um, – you know, that's just me. There's plenty of people, and I understand why they are afraid, because they're intimidating. But I just used to say to these guys at the church, oh, um, he, this guy said to me, oh, you're not afraid of me, are you? He says, I'm in the tribesman gang. And I said, oh, well, you're not that tough. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, you let someone scribble all over your face. Oh, yes. <laughs> and he, just, he just cracked up and laughed at me. He said, oh, you're not afraid? I said, no, I'm not afraid of you, mate. And um, I had a good old mm. chat with them, you know. So, um, but not everyone can do that. You know, they they. they no, can well, do- I wouldn't like. I I definitely would not not like to chat with one. Um, I mean, I got a fright fright one day I was at BP, and one of those guys came in from the Man Up uh, movement. Oh, yeah. Yep. And he had, he had a leather jacket on with this great big circle thing on the back, and you know I, I was looking for the exit, I can tell you, and uh, and I, then I read it and I thought, well, hang on, that's uh, that's not actually a bikey, you know, that's something else. Yeah. And then later on, they turned up at the gym and they had t-shirts with, and on the back it had teaching men to be fathers, and I thought, well, that's a good idea. Yeah, but, I've um, spoken a lot you know, to Brian Tamaki about that Man Up program, and boy, I've got a lot of respect for what he's able to do with those guys. He's converting gang members into valuable members of society that treat their families properly. Oh, it's absolutely outstanding. And the first thing they teach them is to take responsibility, no matter no matter what their culture report is, no matter how bad that mm. is, they actually have to take responsibility for their life, and that's where it starts. Yeah. But... Um, but you know, if I saw saw any any sort of, and they say you know it's targeting Maoris. Well, if I saw a Maori bloke, big and tough, wearing leather and all that insignia on it, and that, I'll tell you what, I've never had anything to do with gang members, but I would run a mile. I don't want to be near anybody like that, you yeah. know. But I'm really, really lucky that you know there's just not that presence here, or not that you can see. They just get on with whatever they do. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me thank you for but your anyway, thoughts on no, that. Anyway, um, no. I'll get on with the boys and um, see what they've got to say. And I, I would bet they've got a pretty similar perspective to you. Oh, well, that'd be interesting. I'll be listening. All right. Thanks for your call, Thanks, me. Thanks, Cam. Okay. Okay, bye-bye. 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 Good evening, Jack. Welcome to Cam's Buddies. Hi, Cam. So. You might have seen the news that the government is uh, moving to ban gang patches. Do you think it'll work? Yes. Yeah, how? Well, I think the average person who's sort of um, looking at this and saying, oh, yeah, it's not going to work, are probably looking at a potuki in places like that where these gangs hang out, and there's only one or two elderly constables sitting there, and, of course, it's not going to work with them. But if I remember rightly, don't the police have a strike force against the gangs? I don't know whether it's still in existence, but they'll have to bring that back in. And what they'll do is they'll wait till there's some tangy or something like that, and then they'll hit them in force and destroy their bikes and take off their patches and do whatever. And they, think, they won't do it. Do you sorry. think the government has got the wherewithal to do that, the steel that's required to, to actually confront the gangs? I'm pretty sure the... The police minister, Mark Mitchell, does, but I'm not sure the rest of the quivering ninnies that sit there in Parliament will cope with um, such an activity. Well, we'll just have to wait and see, won't we? They can't do any worse than the Labour government. I mean, after today's news about the other police minister who wanted to do this and then was vetoed by his fellow Labour ministers. Um, yeah, he threw them under the bus, didn't he? Um, he? He wanted to make the the threshold for confiscation of 
assets. Uh, it was set at 30,000. He wanted to make it zero, so we take everything off them if they're caught, caught committing a crime. And the Wombles and the Labour Party um, said, oh, no, that's racist. We can't do that. I know. Exactly. What about so, what about, about civil liberties considerations? You know, the right to freedom of expression that you can wear a dopey hat or a, a nice little crocheted embroidered patch on the back of your leather jacket. Isn't there some civil liberties expectations there that everybody has a right to do those things? Speaking to the wrong person for an opinion on that. That's why I'm asking. Unfortunately, you. <laughs> <laughs> you better ask someone else. I'm, I'm not woke. No, I don't believe. I mean, I, I I put this to Lindley. I said to her, if you're not a member, a contributing member of society and being law abiding and all those other sorts of things that go with being living in a civil society, then can't, haven't you abrogated your your rights uh, to be treated like an ordinary citizen? And if you're a criminal and you're wearing a uniform of a criminal, because uh, that's basically what it is. These gangs are just creating uniforms. They're not like the Boy Scouts or Girl Guides or whatever they call them these days who are doing actually good things. These people are criminals and they're doing bad things. And haven't they abrogated their right to be able to wear what they please? Absolutely. I'm 100% with you on that. <laughs> but this is just treating a symptom, though, isn't it? We need to have a more systemic um, approach to crime fighting rather than just taking off their patches. No, destroying their motorbikes is the best thing because yeah. that's what attracts all the youngsters, all the uh, bling and so forth. Get rid of it. Well, they systematically Harley Davidson remove really themselves from the... to sell more. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is they ride Harley-Davidson's and those things don't go around corners, so they, they tend to remove themselves from the gene pool eventually. Yes, but not quick enough. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we need to put something in the petrol then. Like what? <laughs> Diesel. <laughs> I don't know, an explosive? Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, yeah I've got control. no time for any of them. Yeah, I'm sorry, I've got no time for gang members at all. Yeah, they, they don't add anything to society, do they? Yep. Get they do, Willie they do tell us. Now he's retired. And a, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Get Willie Appiata now he's retired and a couple of his mates and second them to the police. They only need about three of them to deal with every gang member in the whole of New Zealand. They're all just gone. There's you nine, wouldn't even know where. Yeah, there's 9,000 gang members, but I reckon if you just said to some of those boys or maybe get some, you know, Chechen mercenaries or something like that, fly them in, give them three names each and um, sort it out over a weekend. Yeah, it wouldn't be a fair sort of match, would it? Well, I mean, the, the gang members have all got guns, but whether they can use them is another matter. Um, against the SAS, that would be useless. Yeah. They'd be gone in a flash if they had the authority to do it. Yeah. Instead, we sit there and go, oh, but they were breastfed. Oh, but they they didn't get enough um, uh, love and attention when they were children. Oh, you know, we need to understand that it's because of colonialism. Oh, and then whatever the next excuse is. Yeah, well, you and I both don't subscribe to that, so there no, you are. No, and neither does this government, and that's what a lot of these screaming harridans out there uh, who are caterwauling about, you know, pr um, protecting the rights of the criminal. Uh, they don't understand that the vast majority of New Zealanders want to see criminals in prison uh, and their assets taken and them smashed. And we don't Well, death would be preferable. Be cheaper. Prison, you have to keep paying them money. Well, they, may, well, they should make them work, you know, actually bring back hard labour or even medium labour or any labour at I all. I want to see chain gangs. <laughs> chain gangs on the side of the motorway would be a good sight as you're just crawling past at 5Ks an hour, the average speed on the southern motorway. And they can all wear pink, um, you know, jumpsuits or something something yes. suitably yes. Um, yes. You know, terrible uh, with little arrows on them. Yes. It would be better. It would be a better view than the orange road cones, wouldn't it? That would be wonderful. Well, there's a thought. What about it's never going to happen, road, of course. Oh, pipe dreams, but it would be wonderful. We could use them as road cones maybe. We could. We could. <laughs> oh, we be, we'll get in trouble, yeah. um, uh, Jack, if we keep on this track. Uh, I'll get the – my producer will be uh, you know, giving me the cutthroat signal, you know, cut it off. You can't You can't say these things. Well, anyway, oh, he's saying what people think. I know. <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> All right, Jack, thanks for your contribution this week, and we'll talk again next week. See you later. See you. See you. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Jimmy. G'day, Cameron. How are you this week? I'm, I'm giving you the same answer I give every week. I'm fantastic. Even if I'm not, I'm fantastic. <laughs> now, what's your topic this week, mate? Right. So you might have seen the government has moved to ban gang patches, and I'm just wondering whether you think that'll work, whether it won't. Uh, what are the civil liberties implications, and do we care? I think it's fantastic. I certainly hope it works. It seems to have worked in Australia because all the gangs have moved into the ACT where there's all the woke liberals who yeah. won't implement that law. And I just think it'll be a, a matter of the police implementing the law properly, having the stones to do it. Well, they need you know? to get a new commissioner who's actually going to do some policing. I mean, I'm, I've heard that within the police ranks, um, Costa is known as the Lantern. He's very bright, but it has to be carried. <laughs> I have heard the same thing. But I think that the patch, you know, any criminal enterprise should be illegal to associate together. These gangs aren't businesses. They're, they're dealing serious drugs. You know, we've got a serious mess problem, and it's all fueled by the gangs, whether they're the 501s or whether they're localised. It doesn't matter. They should be targeted and harassed, and life should be made really hard for them. If you don't pay your tax bill, your life gets made really hard for you by the IRD. Why should the yeah. gangs have any different in terms of they need to be harassed by the state? This, how come lefties don't care about people getting harassed by IRD, but they care so much about the police ha harassing people to deal met? Yeah. Make it make sense, Cameron. Yeah. So, what about, what about, I, I uh, what, did you see what Nashi did throwing Labour um, ministers under the bus and he wanted to, uh, toughen up the uh, yeah, the asset seizures. Uh, instead of having a $30,000 limit on how much they could have, he wanted it set at zero so you could take everything off them. And uh, Kerry Allen opposed that and said that uh, it would be racist, we can't do that. And his answer to them, to her, was, well, we're not actually specifying the race of people. We're saying that if criminals do this, we'll take their assets. And then Hipkins backed Kerry Allen. Yeah, because he's woke. She's a woke. She's in front of the due in court for other stuff. I mean, good on Nashi for being brave enough to speak out. I mean, what what the hell has it got to do with race? It's about being a criminal. Yeah. It doesn't matter what the race of the criminal is. If you're dealing meth, particularly if it's Maori gang members dealing meth to marry kids, I mean, it's even more horrendous, you know? So good on Nashi. And that's why he didn't really fit into the new Labour, because he was just a, a bit non woke yeah, he still he confiscated our guns, though. You know, so I, I don't have a lot of uh, sympathy for Nashi, to be fair. Cause, because, I mean, he, he took the gun, took guns off law-abiding citizens, didn't take any off the gang members. No, I, I agree with you on that. Like, that was just, it was just a massive re reaction to, you know, a huge tragedy, you know, and that's just politicians earning points, well, you know, where they can without actually thinking about the, the reality of things. But oh, we we need to get hard on gangs. Mate. I, I, I've been around Auckland for a long time, and I never used to see them. And now I see them almost daily. And they're at the cafe, and you know they're mixing with the locals. It's, it just shouldn't be accepted that these people live off misery. The um, you know, they do was, a little bit. Of... Yeah, you know, I asked Lindley about whether she thought the castle doctrine, having castle doctrine laws, would be useful for combating crime. And, and she didn't know what that was. You know what castle doctrine is, don't you? Yes, I do. It's very good law in Texas, mate, and it w seems to work quite well there. And in Florida. So, yeah, the two, of course, do, it's in do, Florida. Do we, but, do, we, do we need to have that here? Do you think that we should have the right to defend our castle using whatever means necessary? If someone's on our property, in our property, that we have the right to defend ourselves any way that we see fit? I agree with it in principle, but there is a lot of loose cannons out there. What about people who are going to shoot some people that are lost? Or you know, look, I, it's a very complicated problem there. Mm. But if if someone's breaking into your property and being aggressive, and your life's in danger, then you should be able to defend yourself That's without sure. without fear of prosecution from the police who decided that all of a sudden the criminal who was trying to get at you is the innocent party, and you're the bad guy because you stopped him. 
Yeah, well, that's just absolute madness. I, I just don't know how that came about. I mean, that's just mad. But, you know, we're, you know, we've seen horrendous break-in crimes, you know, particularly on farmers' land and, you know, rural parts of New Zealand, Taranaki and that. And, and they should be able to defend themselves because the cops can't get there. It's just, it just should have quite, I guess, have a clear criteria of um, mm. Mm. how it gets prescribed. But, well, but maybe, yeah, so the game should apply like, to rural areas first and see how we go with that. And if it works, then we can start moving it in inwards towards the centre of each city. Well, you know, you know, which suburbs would get all the woke suburbs would get burgled, mate. Cause there'd be no guns there. Yeah. Well, that's what happened in the US. The, yeah, that's the right. Crimson started targeting um, where they knew there wouldn't be guns. Yeah, I mean that's so, why that's why people go and shoot up schools in the United States because all the woke school teachers said declared every school a gun free zone, and the criminals went, "Woohoo, cool! I can go and shoot up a school. I'm not going to get anybody shooting back at me." Well, I don't know. It's pretty crazy to go and shoot up a school. I think there's probably quite a few mental health issues to deal with in the US. And Absolutely. But they're everywhere. But here's the thing, right? Nobody has ever shot up a gun range. Why is that? <laughs> uh, there's been a few shots gone off in the gun range, mate. I've seen people get suspended before. Oh, yeah, I've seen somebody shoot themselves at a, fire. at a gun range. That was not pleasant. <laughs> Him. <laughs> no, all well, the people watching probably. So um, yeah. Mm. Anyway, that's uh, th- we've wrote, we've wandered off the topic, Cameron. Well, isn't it just a symptom of the frustration that people are uh, experiencing in society that we've we seem to have a woke police force that's more concerned about whether they have a rainbow tick or their police cars have rainbow stripes on them rather than actually going around and, and using the end of a PR24 baton to sort out um, a few gang members by cracking some skulls. I saw John Minder got one on the head the other day. I was quite impressed with that. Oh, dear. How um... oh, sad. No, <laughs> <I'm not. laughs> hey, um, uh, well, I'm going off topic, mate. I must, be, I must say Luxon's gone a little bit woke of late. He's wobbly, isn't he? He's a, he was. He looked really good at the start there, but now he's trying to appease the woke. They'll never vote for him. So what's he up to? I don't know. But he stood up to the media the other day when that uh, guy at uh, at Stuff, Glenn McConnell, was having a whinge about government ministers coming on uh, reality check radio shows, and he was having a big conniption about it. And Luxon said, "Oh, we we'll, we'll speak to anybody." And I, t- I thought that was pretty good. I, I thought what I'll do is I'll give him a call and say, when are you coming on my show now? We'll put in a booking, mate. The, um, yeah, I think the, the me- like I think the politicians sort of go through stages of being scared of the media and then I guess there's other points where they just think it's just too pathetic and, and bite back. I mean, my view is that politicians should be scared of the media no matter who they are. They should be scared of them because the, the media are going to hold them to account and uh, make sure that their feet are held to the fire and they honour their promises. That's if we had a decent media that would actually do that, that and you, ask the hard questions. You're talking questions. about the old media, not the one that's going to, you know, miss, tr- twist the truth into some bullshit and then have a headline that's totally misleading and then end up calling them racist or something when it, it's clearly not. Yeah, that, That's mean, what they're scared of. Exactly. You know, they're scared that someone will be offended, you know, you and I aren't afraid of offending people. We do it all the time on a daily occurrence, <laughs> hourly even. It's just what we do. Well, I have been encouraging people around me to speak their mind. I know people just hold their tongues at, you know, certainly academic things and um, other, you know, like work events and, and they just go along because they just don't want to cause a, you know, they go the along thing, to but, get, but we, They go along to get along. Yeah, but if if everyone just sort of started speaking against it, and then a few more people might join in, and then we we actually see that the emperor doesn't have any clothes on, and we get back to a normal functioning society. Yeah, exactly. We need some more sensibleness yeah. uh, happening out there. We just need people to be more truthful, and 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 because most people don't agree with it. But look, look at the last election. Well, the left hasn't seemed to grasp that tiny. yet, have they? No. Hey? The left hasn't grasped that they lost the election. They, in a battle of ideas, they had dumb ones. 
Yeah, they lost, and they lost comprehensively, and they're still losing more ground, and they just aren't accepting it, and they're just thinking everyone else is stupid. It's <laughs> uh, it's good times. Oh well. If, anyway, well, we should do is we should have Cam's buddies in charge, not the Wombles that are currently there. <laughs> Oh, the current lot who are currently in power, I'm reasonably happy, mate. I'm, I'm a lot happier than I was a year ago. Yeah. Well, yeah. at least we can speak our mind and not worry about it these days. You know, before when the Ardernists were in charge, you worried about the Stasi coming and kicking in your door because you said something about, you know, some rainbow person who, who's got some strange <laughs> pronouns. You weren't allowed to, you know, that was death by firing squad no. if you insulted them. I've been watching a few videos on X of Arden's little rants about keeping people in isolation longer if they don't take a test. Or mm-hmm. I was just thinking how close we were to such an awful situation. No, no, we weren't close yeah. to it. We were in a, an awful situation where rights were ignored and overridden and laws were broken by the people who should know better. You yeah, know? And, and, and the media were all toadied along with it. Well, she paid them. <laughs> I mean, they literally. I mean, I used to use a term, uh, you know, back in the day, calling people lick spittles. Well, that's what the media became. They became lick spittles of the Ardern regime. You know, if she said, um, "I'd like you to jump over there," they'd say, "Oh, well, how far far would you like me to jump?" <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank goodness that time period's over, mate. That was terrible. It's the yeah. worst. Well, we shouldn't I'm, even I'm let really... them forget it. I think a lot of people are super angry and, and it's going to take a long time to forget. And I think a lot of the current politicians who are in that government will have to retire and go and do other jobs because people just won't forgive them no. for a long time. A good long time. Anyway. All right. Thanks for your call, Jimmy. Good I'll talk again. to you next thanks, week. Mate. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Paul. Uh, hi. How are you this day? Yeah, pretty good, actually. Uh, you know, boxing on. That's the story. Now, I've got a What's question. today's topic? Today's topic, um, you might have seen a couple of stories. One is uh, uh, about the government uh, moving to ban gang patches and whether that will work or not. And uh, the other one is uh, Stuart Nash coming out and throwing his former Labor buddies under the bus saying, well, I tried to do all these things to stop crime and they didn't want to do it. Right. Well, um, the, the gang patches is very interesting to me because I know that um, – I was watching an article on the television, not that all truth comes from the television, but they were talking about how the gangs would take them on and tell the police who to. And some of the places um, down on the the east coast there seem to have like five police officers and 500 gang members or 1,200 gang members. So it's very hard for these things to go. But I think if the... um, the police were able to conscript the conscript the army to come in, and then um, ceremonially ceremonially take a number of these patches off these fellows. I think that would be a really um, really interesting thing. I know to some extent um, at one of the gyms I used to attend, um, one of the officials there said no no patches in the gym. And so anybody that came to the gym left their patches in the car outside somewhere else. So everybody just looked like they were normal citizens, not one group trying trying to intimidate another. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're not someone who's, who can be intimidated too by gang members either, just quietly. Well, I don't like to... I, I am scared of being scared, so I really um, like to front up if anything's going wrong. But I'm not to say that, you know, these things aren't a little troublesome, but I've always thought, well, normally if, if you can face people down as individuals, um, if they've got an issue, it's quite amazing how all sorts of people that have all sorts of um, things that would actually think you'd be, um, you sort of, all these intimidation things to think they're tough, one-on-one, they're not that tough. They often are just normal people, like I'm yeah. a normal person. Yeah, one-on-one. Um they're not that tough, and you and I have got some good experience on that, stories that will probably curl a few people's toes in here um, if they heard them. But our experience is that they're actually not that tough uh, when you're one-on-one with them. 
uh, when they're p- playing oh. up a big, a big um, in front of a group, well, it's a different story. But again, um, you can you can counter that a little bit. And I had different people from um, the Black Power working for me at one stage, and unbeknownst to me, they had reasonable ranking if such a thing occurs, but they were of a higher rank. And so mm. people would come into um, work and start threatening me, and next thing you know, one of my staff who I thought was just um, a just one of the foremen on one of the jobs goes over and has a word with them, and the bloke looked terrified and <laughs> moved on, and he said he won't bother you again. And I thought, very interesting. Mm. They, were, they were pretty good blokes, those guys who were working on the tools then. But they, they were all hard-working, reasonable Kiwis is what mm. I thought, and um, some of them had made a few mistakes in life, and many of them had, for some reason, thought it was a good idea to tattoo themselves on the face. It definitely slows your employment opportunities, but um, they, they were one working, when working one on one, when talking to me or any other respectful, good sort of citizens is what I thought. Um, but I think this idea, if the government has the ability to pull it off, they will need to raise the police force or or have a lot of backing for them because I don't think people are going to go down and just say, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a non-event. And um, I saw also that they were taking some of these motorcycles and crushing them. I think that was quite a spectacle. And I think many people cheered on thinking, I wonder how people who don't work for a living can afford a fifty to to $100,000 motorcycle. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I always joke that Harley Davidsons are like the Remington rifles of the motorcycle world. You you, you get a standard one, uh, you know, off the rack, and it's of no use to man or beast, and you have to spend a, quite a considerable amount of money making them work properly. Um, you're not a fan of Harley Davidsons either, are you? I am not. I um, there's a number of motorbikes that were that I had that I've owned from you that were a Japanese knockoff of a Harley, except. Being a knockoff of a Harley, they did everything correctly. Like they had a overhead um, cam motor as opposed to a push rod. They had um, fluid cooled. They had drive shaft. All these things they, they performed better. Corners. They Is had it? yes. <laughs> if you if you were to lay it down, you could lay it down. Like I scraped the pegs a number of times on on such a bike, and it was um and it stayed with you. And if you tried to drive off with the stand down, um it would the engine would cut out, so that whereas a lot of Harleys just keep driving, and then as they turn the corner for whatever reason, it throws the rider and causes them a mischief. Oh dear, how sad! Never mind. <laughs> yeah, so, yes, so and you, as far as um, yeah. I think um, Stuart Nash was one of the most ineffective ministers I think I've ever seen. I think he he had high hopes, and um, but. In the reality and the enacting of what he did, he just proved that he was little or nothing here, nothing to see here. Yeah, he he thought he was all that in a bag of chips, and turns out he wasn't. Well, I found it amusing at different times. Like, he he didn't know when it was the right time to be a, uh, like, his vitriol when he had some speech after the winning of the um, a couple of elections back, it just went down like a lead balloon. I'm thinking, talk about can't read a room. The the bloke was classic. Mm. Yeah, I thought he was pretty ineffectual, and what he did to um, shooters uh, and confiscation of firearms was pretty appalling because the gangs never handed back their guns. That's the one thing that the government was said about was criminalising law-abiding licensed firearms owners while at the same time cuddling up to the criminals like the mongrel mob. Yes, well, it's um, interesting that there's some tiny homes that I'm involved with, and people are saying, take them up north and sell them to people on Maori land. They don't need a building permit. And I'm mm. thinking, how is it possible that they don't need a building permit? No building inspector dares go up and have a look at what they're doing. Talk, talk about a rule for law-abiding citizens and a rule for unlaw-abiding citizens. It's sort of a bit interesting. And a number of police have been interviewed and said, would you... Um, would you give a gang member a um, a ticket for driving recklessly or doing this, whatever, on the road? And they say, no, and when they get back to the station, my understanding is they get mocked because if they were to give them a ticket, first of all, the 
what's the guy's real address? So you've got to spend a lot of time trying to find the actual person who did the offence. Then he's not going to pay his fine. And when he doesn't pay his fine, you're going to spend more time chasing after him to get the money out of him. And if you happen to go there, and this is all assuming that when you stopped him in the first place, you didn't get yourself a hiding. And so if there's a group of lawless people who act in a manner however they like, and then the police think it's no problem to ticket a 70-year-old man or woman because they're not going to give them any trouble, this is not the society that I grew up in. This is not how I think it should work. I think that it's one law for all, and if someone offends, then we get sufficient police to go and sort out whatever the problem is. Yeah, and if we've got politicians that have got a bit of metal, a bit of spine, a bit of backbone, that don't cave in to the woke you know, caterwauling about um, whether or not it's racist or not, then we might get somewhere. And maybe the the gang patch ban is a, a good start, um, but it's that's all it is, is a good start. I think it's a good start. And, and to actually get offenders off the street, I think, is a much better thing. And if it causes them to offend... Um, when you're trying to take their patch off them, then were they guilty of the offence or did you, as the police, cause the offence? And so I think they, they we'll end, end up with some quite interesting um, judicial cases if this does happen, yeah. because who caused the crime? Was it the, was it the um, gang member or was it the police officer trying to take the gang member's property for whatever reason, whether it's legal or illegal? Yeah, I mean... Um you know, talking with Lindley, we, we came up with the conclusion that this was just a good start and we need to actually start addressing some issues around responsibility, personal responsibility, those sorts of things. And she mentioned the Man Up program, and I thought that that's what the government should be doing. They should actually bo- go and sit down with Brian Tamaki and say, right, how can we get Man Up into the prison so we can break this cycle? Sure, we can take their gang patches off them, we can put them in prison when they commit a crime, but what happens next? And uh, to my mind, the only thing that that has got any proven track record is the Man Up program. Well, um, Brian, if you talk to him, and I have a couple of times, seems like he's really got the best interest of the families at heart. Mm. And the big thing about joining a gang is the breakdown of the family unit. And so if mum and dad are together at home, as a family unit, they bring up good kids. If there's mum at home and or dad at home and there's no male role models that are examples of how to behave, then the young men look for something that is inclusive and a gang is. And so by not addressing the problem of broken families or single-parent families, you're actually causing... Um, it becomes a breeding ground. When the state is acting as your parent, um, then this is a breeding ground for antisocial behaviour. And so even a, a bad dad's better than no dad often. And I'm not mm. saying women should stay there and, and take beatings, but I'm thinking that sometimes we don't try hard enough to keep the family together. And yeah. when the family breaks down, that's when we have people running off the rails and then we have young people who get themselves into trouble. Then, then, then they get attracted to the yes. gangs, and then it's a, a cycle to downwards to prison. Yes. Well, and I that's think... the sort of thing that, like, just um, just recently, I think um, uh, someone I know very closely was stood down from school, and and as such, what occurred with his stand down is hero status, and so <laughs> when you see. Um, young people who are committing petty crimes of sort and they get hero status amongst their peers, then suddenly they want to escalate to get more of the same accolades possibly as as young men. And I'm thinking we need to work out a system whereby if you've done wrong at school and you're punished, you don't come out of it being a hero, you come out of it being um, somewhat contrite for your poor mm. behaviour. Yeah, exactly. I hear you. I, I think, um, you know... Having said th- that, well, having said that, I think some of the schools are so woke that you get punished for things that, in my day, were was a discussion, and now it's considered um, 
a playground fight. Whereas when, when there, if you would have to put gloves and put a ring around it, then we could have sorted out some differences with the young men letting off a bit of steam and, and getting rid of a bit of their testosterone or, or using it productively. But now anything like that, because of the um, video phones and all that, it goes online and suddenly the school's embarrassed and next thing you know, um, everybody's getting stood down or suspended or whatever. Because And suddenly you've got people who um, aren't learning the finer points of the male hierarchy. No, that's right. I mean, when I was at school, there was definitely a pecking order. And um, if you if you fell foul of that, uh, excuse the joke, but uh, if you fell foul of that, you certainly got um, disabused of your um, uh, of your notions of above your actual status very quickly. Exactly. And, but and, nowadays and they call that everyone bullying. knew where they were going. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know? I, I I don't know if it's actually bull- bullying because in life we learn the same things with our intellect. And who, whoever makes the most money at the end kind of wins. So he gets, or she gets, people working for them, doing things for them um, for money. And, and it's we've, we've sort of lost the competition factor and we've lost entrepreneurial behavior and um, we've lost the work ethic. And I'm just looking and thinking, is it any wonder that folk are resorting to gangs and when they get there, um, it's like a family. It, it's like someone who will use a code. You don't uh, mess up against the code, or you'll you'll get dealt to in one manner or another. And mm. so, all the things that were the discipline that were lacking in the home and normal discipline in the schools, the gangs seem to have it. And, and you sort of think this is a little bit topsy turvy. Yeah, it is. As I said to said to uh, Lindley, it's ass backwards. But uh, you know, maybe Christopher Luxon should should get Cam's buddies all together, and we'll solve all these problems. We could give him a couple of coaching efforts. <laughs> exactly. All right, Paul. Thank you for your call, and I'll talk to you next week. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye. Right. Welcome to Cam's buddies, Miles. Good afternoon, Cam. How are you? Yeah, good. Box of birds. Everything's fantastic. Excellent. I'm, I'm having a few chortles and laughs at, at the other buddies coming up with uh, solutions for crime and things like that, and that's what we want to talk about today. The government's got uh, uh, an announcement this week that they're going to start uh, passing legislation to uh, start taking gang patches off gang members, and at the same time we've had uh, Stuart Nash throwing his Labour uh, minister, fellow Labour ministers back when they were in government under the bus saying, well, I tried to do this sort of thing and they told me I was racist. What What are your thoughts on those two things? Well, uh, you know, I find myself laughing um, because if you look at what Goldsmith said, we need to take action to reduce the gang's ability to engage in criminal behaviour and -hmm. prevent them from endangering and intimidating Kiwis. Good Lord, they're going to do that by, oh, what? Oh, you can't wear your gang patch in public. Gosh, that'll stop them. I can think that that'll just call a complete halt. No. I think they're um, the devil's going to be in the details, but I think they're barking up the wrong tree. Sure, it sounds good, but um, just imagine if the uh, the detail meant that uh, listeners wearing their RCR T-shirt, that insignia was considered a gang because of some quirk in the law. Uh, I mean... That would just be horrific. And, uh, you know, this sort of thing where insignias can be banned is is a, a sorry path that we're treading, I, I feel. Well, we had um, Jack earlier and Paul uh, earlier who suggested that perhaps we should utilise another gang that wear uh, green and tan and, and boots and things like that and carry sort of long black things and get them to sort them out. And and Jack suggested that we might actually deploy the SAS in a more effective manner to deal with these gang members. And there's 9,000 gang members, and he reckons that, that the squadron could probably go through them in about 10 minutes. Oh, I think 9.3 minutes, but, yeah, uh, it's fine. I think here we are 
debating gang insignia, and I think it's a it's a stupid law. But I'll have to say one thing. You look at what they're planning to do, police issue dispersal notices, which will require gang members to leave the area and not associate with each other for seven days. I mean, that's laughable. These people are criminals. The first thing they're going to do is go, oh, well, we've been kicked out of here. We'll get round at the bros' place. They won't be listening to that. Well, I mean, just, they'll just, just saunter away and um, laugh in the police's face. Eh? Yeah, thumb, thumb their nose at the courts who are going to issue non-consent consorting orders, which will stop gang offenders from associating or communicating with one another for up to three years. Have these idiots not heard of the digital revolution? I, I doubt very, very much whether... Um, known criminals will actually follow a court. <laughs> well, they don't. I mean, that, that's the thing. I mean, this is the thing that, that it's the same with gun laws, right? They, they pass all these laws and they say, this is going to stop crime. No, it won't because criminals well, don't follow the law. Well, it's interesting that Mr. Goldsmith in his, in his press release about the magical effect of banging, banning an insignia, I'm sorry, banning an insignia says that there's been a significant escalation in gang-related violence, public intimidation and shootings. How could, how could there be an escalation of shootings? We've got the Firearm Safety Authority. You know, their, their mission is in their name, firearm safety. Oh, oh that's right. It's only for the law abiding. <laughs> well, what I've found with firearms, if you leave them alone, they don't leap off the desk and run around and do terrible things, right? They, they just don't. Correct. <laughs> Correct. You know, it's people but, that are the problem. I mean, I, okay, look, I've had a bit of a laugh at the law, the, the proposed law, but actually um, there is one thing that I quite like about it. The law will also be changed to give greater weight to gang membership as an aggravating factor well, that's of sentencing. That's a good idea. Yeah, agree with I that. I think that's a great idea. I mean, hallelujah. Shouldn't it, it be called the aggravated, uh, aggravated um, factor? And shouldn't the courts say, if you're a gang member, you add three years to your um, sentence, non-negotiable no matter what? And... Uh, very quickly, we'd see the the, the judges, and, and really, I, I don't have a hell of a lot of respect for judges. I think the judges and the police have, have strayed down the woke road, and we're seeing some very, how should I say, biased judges and biased policing, and, and I'm not happy about that at all. But if there was a law that said, no matter what, if you're a gang member, you get an extra three years, well... Yeah, so be it. But here's my solution. Hey, we've got all these laws and, and they already exist. Why don't the police enforce them? What What's wrong with the police? Chance would be a fine thing. Well, I mean, look at it this way. If the National wanted to get tough on gangs, just declare them a domestic terrorist organisation. Well, that's what Winston They'd be gone said by Monday. Election. That's what Winston said in the, ele in the election campaign, declare gangs are domestic terrorists. And uh, we can use the full weight of the terrorism laws against them, which would include using the SAS. And and they'd be gone by Monday. I mean, but instead we get these ludicrous reports from the press of gang members, I don't know, queuing up at tattoo parlours to get their gang insignia tattooed on their head or, or whichever part of their anatomy they're going to display in public. Have these I mean, guys not I'm heard just... of belt sanders and angle grinders? <laughs> oh, <laughs> nothing so serious, but it's, it gets laughable. I mean, and, you know, human beings, by their very nature, are, are quite uh, um, interested in laws. And who's to say that the new gang insignia for gang XYZ isn't a, a blue New York Yankees cap or woe betide some other American... Um, Chicago's... Chicago uh, football Bulls or team cap, like yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, if you're, if you're, the, yeah, I don't know, but you know, they they could switch in a second from having, uh, I don't know, a big rondelle well, they'll, they'll thing. Just um, from, they'll just change from insignia to colours. That's what they'll do, and you, you can't legislate against colours. 
Yeah, imagine that. Otherwise, Granny would be going down to the supermarket in the blue dress and, and that'd be it. She'd be in the slammer because the police sure as hell wouldn't want to arrest that big dude over there dressed in blue. But Granny, she looks like she's she looks, she a gang looks like member. She, yeah, Off she, she looks goes. subversive. She looks very subversive. <laughs> Anyway, Miles, I don't think okay. we're going to solve this problem, but thanks for calling, and we'll talk next week. Indeed. We'll see you next week, Cam. Bye. Okay. Bye. Gosh, my buddies are awesome. I'm so blessed to have such a great bunch of mates and new buddies to share anything with. They're so wise and speak common sense, except occasionally Jack loses the plot. But, hey, that's why we love him. Tell us your thoughts on Cam's Buddies by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thanks for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. Do you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to? Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We'd love to hear from you, so connect with us today.